this responsibility, the burden of defense of the West against radical Islam. It's a illiberal doctrine that threatens Western freedom. But what we didn't realize is due to our very success in the first phase of 45 years and the second one, and remember this second phase since 1989, we're still in, we're in the 30th year of it the fall, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and we're still supposed to be the keeper of the values of the West to defeat the Soviet Union and now it's transferred to these local thugs and radical Islam. But the problem is, did the world change? And were the premises of the post-war world order, were they still valid? And there were starting to be disturbing indications that while we still respected these institutions and we subsidized them and we intervened for the world order and we spent more than the next 19 military budgets in the world and we still lost Americans all over the globe, other people didn't think that we were doing this for them, or our enemies did not think the end of history was here. So we started to examine the last four or five years certain questions. I mean, they, they, were, they were not cut and dried issues. The new world order, the post-world world had assumed, remember, that democratization would put us in this end of history. So we had a country like China. We said to ourselves, there's a billion people, we need to bring it into the family of democratic nations. And according to people at the Hoover Institution where I work, the more affluence you have, the more you have a free market, even if it's a quasi-free market, the more liberalization inevitably follows. So we said to ourselves over the last 30 years, if they cheat, they being the Chinese on patents, it's okay. They're eventually gonna be wealthy and then they'll be democratic. If they cheat on copyright, they're wealthy, they'll be democratic. If they dump on the world market, it doesn't matter. If they run up a $350 billion surplus, it doesn't matter. If they go into the Spratly Islands and violate local uh, treaties with the Philippines or Vietnam, Japan, it doesn't matter because they're, going to, they're getting wealthier and they're getting more like us. They wear suits and ties, they come to Silicon Valley, it doesn't matter. And all of a sudden we decided, I don't think they're, we said collectively, I don't think they're gonna become democratic. In fact, I think they're using free markets at the direction of the government to be the next Soviet Union. They're becoming more powerful than we are. And yet the status quo of the post-war order, the Council of Foreign Relations, the main think tanks, Brookings, American Enterprise Institute, Hoover Institution, the government department at Harvard, the council, and all these people said, no, 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 they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be democratic. They're going to eventually going to be one of us, and we have to take that hit. And remember also what the rationale of the post-war war order was, that since the rest of the world is flat and they're not, they don't have the wherewithal to be the global policeman and the global economic power and the global market for new, newly recovering countries to export and run up surpluses. We do. We do. We do. We heard that for 75 years. We're so powerful, we're so rich, we can do it. And we can take a $350 billion surplus with China. We, we're so rich. We looked at Europe. Well, Europe was not the same the last 10 years as it was. This EU, this European Union, we thought was going to be a common market, and then it was going to expand to sort of a common alliance. It was going to be an adjunct maybe of NATO. We didn't realize that this was some kind of Bonapartist utopian scheme, that they were going to outlaw war, they were going to open their borders to the people of the world, they were going to be leaders in climate change, they were going to disarm, they were going to have an act basically a democratic socialist paradigm, and we were going to defend them, and they were going to get very angry that we defended them. And we said to ourselves, it, we can do this. So if, if Germany has a $65 billion trade surplus with us, or during the, the uh, 2003 war, if the EU, all of the countries have damned us and they, France votes against us, it's okay, because this is the post-war order. That's what we're supposed to do. And then we said, Germany, is the most powerful country, it's got 80 million, it's, this, it's historically been dangerous, but we solved the problem. 
because it's in the EU and it's in NATO. And people started to say, well, wait a minute, the last 10 years. The Pew, the Pew poll said that Germany polls of all countries in Europe the most anti-American. Under Obama, it was 53% of Germans like the United States. Today, it's 37%. It, Italians like Americans at twice the rate as Germans. And as I said, they're running at 65 billion, and they have dictated financial terms to the southern credit, uh, debtor nations, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal. They have dictated immigration issues to Poland, Romania, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. They have dictated the conditions of Brexit to the UK, and they have told us we're spending 1.4% of our GDP on defense, and we're not going to go up and meet our promises at 2%. And we've said to them, if you don't invest 2%, how are we going to get the Belgians? And how are we going to get the Dutch? And how are we going to get the Norwegians to do it and meet their, because they follow your lead. And you're cutting a potentially large deal with Putin at $400 billion, and yet you want us to defend you from Putin? What's going on? This, doesn't, this isn't part of the post-war order. It, didn't, it wasn't supposed to work like that. And then we looked at Russia and we thought, at the end of communism, Yeltsin is, a, is one of us. We've sent up all of our Harvard economists over there. Russians are, are meeting us. They love us. They're going to make Harvard or Yale there. It's going to be a liberal democracy. It's got oil. And that didn't happen. It sort of became an autocratic, oligarchic, uh, you know, let's be, it's an orthodox country, it's deeply religious. It, it didn't seem the liberal country that we had counted on. We looked at the EU to take the entire EU and we said, wow, the demography is not even replacing its population, it's 1.4. Half of the churches are empty, it's a secular country. They have no means or ability or desire to assimilate, intermarry, or integrate Muslim immigrants. It, it seems foreign to us. But that's not supposed to be part of the post-war order. And the subtext of all this was, we can do it because we're the wealthiest country in the world. But under the tenets of globalization, which were, went hand in glove with American post-war leadership, people started to say, well, I'm starting to catch on to globalization. And that is, we take a big two, $365 billion hit with the Chinese, $65 billion with the Germans, $75 billion with the Mexican government, $75 billion, second only to Germany, excuse me, to China. It's bigger than the German. And we let three, 30 million, excuse me, $30 billion in remittances go back to Mexico, half of whom are being subsidized by the U.S. government, the people who send that money back. But we can do it. We're wealthy. We can be in NAFTA. We have a, the Canadians are wonderful people. If we have a small $15 billion deficit, that's not a problem. If Germany has the largest account surplus in the world, larger even than China in terms of financial service and the whole picture, at over $300 billion, we can do it. And then we started to look at places like Hillsdale County or southern Fresno County. And we started to see something that was very striking. That we, I say we, it wasn't we. It were people that we wrote off as nuts that were questioning the, the post-war order or were disruptive or chaotic. They started to say certain things. And they said, I've come to the conclusion that under this second phase of the post-war order, we have an ossified foreign policy and military policy and strategic policy that doesn't fit this changing world, that doesn't fit the new China or the new EU, or South America didn't become all democratic. It's, because it's reverting to socialism. Or the more we reach out to Iran, it's not working. But what is happening is that anybody who has a job that involves muscular labor, and that job can be Xeroxed overseas, it will be Xeroxed overseas. And this divide is, is destroying this country culturally, socially, geographically, because we're creating two very wealthy cultures from Florida to Boston and from La Jolla to Seattle. And they're in culture, 
in taste, in affinity closer in the West Coast to maybe Shanghai and Tokyo and the East Coast to London and Paris than they are to Hillsdale. This is, the, this is the interior culture. And these interior culture people that work assembling products are the industrial heart of America that won World War II that had a greater GDP than all the other combatants and allies together have been hollowed out because they can have their job replicated and the people on the coast can't. China can't build a Stanford University yet. Japan still hasn't figured out quite to, to match our hedge fund. As one person, I gave a talk not too long ago, and a very angry person that said, Mr. Hansen, do you wake up one morning and find somebody did your column for half the price from South Korea? I said, no, that hasn't happened yet. He said, when it will, you know how I feel. And the point was that we were starting to say that these were the deplorables, clingers, expendables. They were the losers of globalization. We went the next step and said, it wasn't just that they lost out, but they deserved to lose out. They didn't move. They took math. It was almost as if they, they developed the pathology and then the industry left rather than what really happened. The industries left and then they developed the pathologies. So this post-war order had not caught up to these new global realities. And we tried to adjust. 2009 to 2016, Barack Obama came in with a new foreign policy. And give him credit, he understood that the old George W. Bush going into Iraq or Afghanistan or Georgia, it's not the same thing anymore. But he took, he took this evidence and he came up with a very disturbing conclusion. And he said, the reason it's not working is our fault because we try to impose our will on people. And who's to say that a, a United States democratic liberal society is any better than what's in Iran? And you know, we always bought back these Gulf monarchies in Israel, but maybe Iran should be a legitimate hegemony. And maybe we should, who were to say that yeah. we can dictate to them when they get nuclear weapons, so we'll do this Iran deal. And we got a, the reason that we haven't had a Palestinian solution is that because we've been backing the wrong people. The Israelis are intolerant or illiberal. And it doesn't really matter that we have capitalist countries in Latin America. Maybe Venezuela or Nicaragua or Cuba has a better paradigm. And the EU is pretty good. We should be more like the EU than the EU should be like us. And he didn't address the people in the interior. He furthered that diagnosis. They deserve what they got. So now we've spent 25 minutes, and you can see what's going to end up. Somebody comes along and says he's on a stage with 16 Republican nominees. He has no military experience, and he has never served in political office and he doesn't give a blank blank about the Council on Foreign Relations. He doesn't care about NATO. He looks at this as a businessman, and he says it's a bad deal. He looks at optional wars like a reality TV show. They have, if you go into somewhere, you usually get bad ratings, and it doesn't work out on a cost-benefit analysis. So that was his idea about going into Libya, for example. And so he's not wedded to any of these things, and he starts to look at the world empirically that's changed radically from the post-war order's second phase, which was supposed to deal with it. And he add the Obama aberrance, and he starts to come up with crazy ideas. Crazy to them, maybe not so crazy to us. And he said, I like NATO. All they got to do, they're wealthy countries, the GDP of Europe and the population is greater, just pay what they promised. Don't pay as much as we do, but just pay, we pay 4% GDP into military spending. You pay two. If you're not going to do it, we're going to leave. Well, I don't think he was going to leave, but that was what he said. And he said to Mexico, you know what? We might have to close the border. We might have to yank out some of the factories and the trade deals, and we might have to put a tariff on products that are sent back. People said, you can't use the word tariff. That's not part of the post-war order. And basically, Trump said, well, I don't really want to put it on top. That's art of the deal. I threaten, I threaten, I threaten. And they'll back down maybe from 350 billion surplus to 2 billion. That's a victory. But nobody had ever thought like that before. He was endangering the post-war order. And he looked at the world throughout, and he started to come up with a foreign policy. And they actually memorialized it in 2017. If you take looked at the strategic plan of the United States and national security, 
security assessment written by H.R. McMaster and his team, it's pretty much called principled realism. And it is a complete rejection of 75 years of foreign policy of the United States. And it's predicated on the idea that foreign policy and domestic policy are inseparable. And there were certain shibboleths there that we should recognize for what they are. China, the wealthier it's going to be, is going to be more autocratic. The Palestinians are never going to be democratic until they, on their own, throw out their corrupt elite. And we can't help them do that anymore. And Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan are probably not going to be democratic, but they're better than the alternative in Iran. Radical Shia, you know, messianic, expansionary Islam. And Latin America is likely to be communist as capitalist, but if we have our druthers, we're going to support capitalist states and not communist. And you start to read it, you, it was termed Jacksonian. Don't tread on me foreign policy. And what that meant was, I think, if you read it carefully, it means we're not going to seek trouble in the world. We're not going to be the world's policemen, but we are going to deter our enemies, and we will strike back if they strike us back. And we may have to preempt once in a while, and that will make a safer world. And it might have the same effect, but we're not going to claim that every single struggle in the world is of interest to somebody in Hillsdale County because we've seen where that leads economically, domestically. And we're going to start be asking for, we have two doctrines of the new Jacksonianism, as I understand it. I'm not being an advocate, I'm trying to explain to you. Is one is, if what they are doing doesn't matter, why do they do it? If you think trade surpluses don't matter, then why does Germany want them? Why don't they just be like us and say, they don't matter, we'll run a deficit with you. Who cares who has the trade surplus? We'll just take the tariff on you know, American cars and we'll do the same thing as you guys have. You have 2.5% on the Audi, we'll have 2.5% in the Ford. Or if, China, if trade deficits don't matter, we'll run up a $300 billion surplus and China will have a three. And that was sort of the logic that Trump, of course, used. That was the first thing. And the second was that I'm going to calibrate foreign policy in terms of how it affects people. This was kind of scary sometime, and that would mean if we want to stay in Afghanistan, what is the effect on the people who have to go over there? What's the effect on the U.S. budget? And is it really possible to turn Afghanistan into Carmel, California? And if so, at what cost? That was the, that's in the, the principled realism. And so, what made it even stranger was that once we saw this new Trump foreign policy that said, I'm looking at everything empirically. NATO is 65 years old. If it works here, I'm willing to subsidize it if you guys want to participate. NAFTA is there, but it's not written in stone. I'm willing to keep going if it's reciprocal. I'm willing to still trade with China if they, get out of, if they, don't, if they follow the rules in the way that we follow the rules. And everybody said, but we always took a hit. We always took a hit for the greater good. And he said, it's not the greater good, and we can't afford to take the hit. We've done it for 75 years, and we've hollowed out the interior. So that was a very powerful message that got him nominated in ways that 16 other brilliant candidates did not see. And it's enraged the establishment in the university, and the think tanks, and the foundations, and the political bipartisan establishment. And yet he wrote it all out. It was, it's not just herky-jerky. It's written right out in an assessment that we have a new principled realism for a radically different world that doesn't look anything like our foreign policy that was formed in 1945 for a very different world. And if I could sort of summarize it in a, a, just a phrase, it's Jim Mattis gave a speech once, and I think he summarized it. It's no better friend, no worse enemy that the world is not full of neutrals anymore and there's not going to be a global community and there's not going to be a utopian situation or there's not going to be a postmodern globe where we're all climate change advocates and we all believe in gender rights. and It's not going to happen. There's going to be local differences. There's going to be tribalism. There's going to be chaos all over the world as there is as I speak right now. And what we're going to do is 
pretty much look at people that we have more than less in common with and support them. They're going to be our friends. And people we feel are disruptors or don't like this American system, we're going to be enemies to. And that's going to make, actually, because we're a unique, exceptional country and we have better judgment than these global uh, organizations like the UN, that's going to make a safer world abroad. So, and it's going to have a don't tread on me act. Don't attack the United States. Don't point missiles at Portland, Oregon. Don't cheat on trade. Don't fortify the, or something might happen to you. And we're going to make that decision with the allies that we can and by ourselves if we must.